Good evening, everybody. My name is Ware Harmon, and I'm the Executive Director of Town Hall Seattle. On behalf of our organization and our partners at Ellie Bay Books, it's a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's live streamed appearance by Michael Ian Black in conversation with Mike Perbiglia. As we get underway, I want to acknowledge that our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. And we thank you all for tuning in. Town Hall is grateful for the opportunity to invite Seattle audiences into present tense exchanges of issues, ideas, and creativity, creativity even when we can't do it in person. Town Hall will continue to produce online content uh, throughout this fall and into the new year, and as circumstances allow, to host live streams from our building. Meanwhile, if like me, you just can't log quite enough hours on Zoom or YouTube, know that many of our past talks are available in, in video or podcast form under the header digital media. Back to tonight's event. The program will likely run about 30 to 40 minutes, followed by an audience Q&A. Michael and Mike will take questions from the Ask a Question field at the bottom center of your screen. Please keep your questions concise. And Town Hall's Candace Wilkinson, they actually, no, that's not true. That part I was just about to say, not, that's all lies. At any rate, know that you can view the event both here on Crowdcast or over on our YouTube page if you want to utilize that platform closed captioning feature. It's easier for us, though, if you pose your questions over here. And there's also going to be some madness involving the uh, the uh, text field off to the right, but 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 Michael will explain it to you in a moment. At any rate, <laughs> down on podcasts every day, like tonight's event. One of the upsides of virtual programs are the extraordinary conversations they make possible. Derek Black with Catherine Dunn about how democracy is weakened when public education is defunded. That's right after tonight's talk at 7:30, actually. Ron Chu and Naomi Ishisaka on the foundational role of Asian Americans in in Seattle. Uh, Eddie Cole with Sean Scott discussing the influence of college campuses on the struggle for black freedom, and Jane Fonda and Elizabeth Lesser on women's activism to bend the course of climate change. Also, our digital season makes possible a reimagination of our arts programs. Uh, our Town Music Chamber Music Series kicks off this week with cellist and artistic director Joshua Roman returning to Seattle for a 10 week residency called Fermata, celebrating artists' creativity between in person concert appearances by sharing audio and video glimpses of composing, practicing, listening, rehearsing, resting, all in the context of a massive cultural and social pause. For more information about Fermata and everything else that I've just tumbled out at you, visit townhallseattle.org. Our work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Arts and culture programs in particular are supported by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Seattle's Office of Arts and Culture, and the Wincoat Foundation Northwest. But as most of you know by now, Town Hall is fundamentally a member-supported organization, and I want to thank all of our members watching tonight. Newsflash, this is an unprecedented time for nonprofits, and if you're not yet a member and you support Town Hall's mission to make ideas and inspiration accessible to the whole community, we hope you will consider joining us by making a donation to the button at the bottom of your screen. To conclude the infomercial, po infomercial portion of the evening, this isn't an easy time for booksellers either, and since we know you'll want to spend more time with Michael Ian Black's book, urge you to buy your own copy here, now, tonight, through our local independent partners at LA Bay Books using the conveniently positioned button right there at the bottom of your screen. All right then. The prolific comedian, actor, and writer Mike, Michael Ian Black began his career on MTV's beloved sketch comedy show, The State. Among many TV appearances since, he's rec most recently starred in Comedy Central's Another Period. I'm told to tell you that he made his film debut with the role of McKinley in the satire Wet Hot American Summer, but a bit of diligent sleuthing on something called Wikipedia, since his first role was actually as male student in a documentary called Cults, Saying No Under Pressure. And all, all of his friends, that's what Q&A is all about. Anyway, Michael has many, many film appearances to his name, including reprising McKinley for Netflix's Wet Hot American Summer reboots. He's also released two stand-up specials and served as a co-host of the popular podcast Mike and Tom Eat Snacks and Topics, as well as hosting his own interview podcast, How to Be Amazing. Along with all that time in the talkies, he's also known as the author of 13 books, including several books for children, like the award-winning I'm Bored from 2012, wow. I'm Sad from 2018, the parody A Child's First Book of Trump from 2016. His books for adults include the memoirs uh, You're Not Doing It Right and Navel Gazing from 2012 and 2016, respectively, and the essay collection My Custom Van and 50 other mind-blowing essays that will blow your mind all over your face. <laughs> Mike Rebellia is a comedian, storyteller, director, and actor. His most recent shows, The New One, Thank God for Jokes, and My Girlfriend's Boyfriend can be found on Netflix. As a filmmaker, he wrote, directed, and starred in the films Sleepwalk With Me and Don't Think Twice. He currently hosts the weekly podcast, Mike Rebellia is Working It Out. 
He's the author of Sleepwalk With Me and Other Painfully True Stories, and the new one, Painfully True Stories from a Reluctant Dad. As an actor, Berbiglia has uh, appeared on Billions, Girls, and Broad City, and in the films Trainwreck, The Fault in Our Stars, and Pop Star. Michael Ian Black's book, A Better Man, a mostly serious letter to my son, is the subject of your discussion tonight. Please join me in welcoming Mike Berbiglia and Michael Ian Black. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ware. Thank you so much for hosting this uh, event. And thank you, Mike Birbiglia, for agreeing to moderate this event, even though I feel like you owed me because I moderated your event. In That's not what this is not, about. It's, a, it's about, That's not, I it's think. It's not transactional, Michael. We're friends. Is it not? I love you. OK. I read this I'm book, not, I read this book you and it's important you to know that I love you. Oh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate that very much. And I love you too. Now that we've got that out of the way, <laughs> the, I want to know in the comments. Why don't you just bask in that? Why don't you just I bask in, in it? I am basking in it. I am basking in it. I'm basking it. I'm doing it, which is to say I'm doing it artfully. Um, the uh, can you tell me in the comments, because on the right navigation of my screen, I can see everybody. Uh, are you in Seattle or are you somewhere else? I'm just curious. So right. I'm not I'm not in Seattle and I could just tell you. I don't know why you're asking me. I could just tell you. Uh, no, I know where you are. You're in oh. Connecticut, Connecticut, where the book takes place primarily. That's right. That's right. Um, Seattle, Seattle, Seattle. Belltown. Belltown. And then my follow-up, so it seems like majority Seattle. My mm -hmm. follow-up question is, because it's important in terms of which questions we ask, Tacoma, SeaTac, SeaTac, uh, airport. How many people have read the book already? That's A. A, read the book. B, have the book. C, considering the book. What are we doing here? What are we doing here, comments? Write it in the comments. A, B, or C. Read the book, have the book, considering the book. Oh, wow. Oh, look at those, look at those undecided voters, Michael. Good. I feel like they're persuadable, which is all I want. All I want is the opportunity to yeah, yeah, persuade. Yeah. yeah. See, this is crucial. This is crucial. I'm not interested. <laughs> Look, do, you, do, do I want the people who already support me? Yes. Am I also looking to sway the undecided? Absolutely. Yes, yes. Um, I'm not going to ask for your vote. So I'm going to have, so we're going to, I'm going to start the conversation by saying, before you've heard anything we've said, because It'll, Michael will inevitably interrupt me and shout over me and I will say sensible things and he'll, he'll have sort of this overwhelming <laughs> macho thing going on. Um, but I want you to know uh, that I love this book and it made me cry. It, as you can see, it, uh, some of my makeup is uh, running <laughs> because I finished it moments ago and it made me cry. Oh, someone wrote, I only read audiobooks. The audiobook is great. I listened to the audiobook and I I, I uh, was given the, the, this book. Uh, as I guess <laughs> I should say. I, but I did buy the audiobook, but then this was, this was given to me. But um, so, Michael, I love this. Uh, I love this book. It made me cry. Why do you want to make me cry is my first question. Uh, I mean, I feel like you're taking it maybe more personally than it was in <laughs> a letter to my son. The subtext is very clearly a letter to Mike Verbiglia. Yeah. I was, so I'm surprised that you picked that up so readily. I actually did find I mean, it. I, I found it to be remarkably universal for being a book that is a letter to your son. Someone's saying for me to get closer to the mic. That's why I pulled in the laptop. Uh, hopefully that helped. Did it help? 
Patty? Patty's so far, saying, so good. Get closer. Um, how did you manage that? Because it's so definitively a letter to your actual son. Uh, did you have to, in the draft process, uh, start to open it out to create a universality for the reader? Well, I, I, I would imagine you understand this better than most people um, because of the nature of your own work that so often what happens is the more specific you get with details from your life and the more personal yes. and kind of vulnerable you get in a weird way, the more universal it becomes. And I think it's because we all kind of go through the same details are always different for people, but those, those same sort of deep feelings of vulnerability, of, um, uh, of personal. So when you tell your story as honestly as you can, I feel like that often resonates with people despite the actual specific Yeah, I felt like I was I was drawn in immediately. I, I it's not a spoiler because it's on page one or two. I was drawn in immediately because you talk about your proximity to Sandy Hook. Uh and and and, and your children were in school when the Sandy Hook uh shooting happened nearby um and i felt like i was drawn in so uh yeah. quickly and uh man it's um did you know did you know did you have at that point that the sandy hook incident happened the wisdom that you reflect at the end of the book which is to say about masculinity or was that the beginning of embarking on sort of like trying to understand masculinity was it was it like a was i, I don't know is, is that what provoked it you think? i think i understand that. you're you're breaking up a little bit but i think i know understand the question um so sandy hook happened about a dozen half a dozen miles from my house um my kids were in elementary school at the time so it was definitely like my kids are in elementary school and this thing is happening at an elementary school right next door um and it was obviously, I say in the book, it was like a, a tornado touching down. And that is kind of what it felt like. And I don't want to take any of like Newtown's king and own it as my own, but it felt like a uh, tornado hitting the town right next door and all the devastation kind of rippled out from that community. I was not particularly thinking about masculinity in that, in that moment. Um, or really in general. And it wasn't until the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting happened when my kids were in high school. Again, I was a high school, my kids were in high school, um, that I really started asking questions about why it is that boys and young men are the ones that are doing these crimes. What is it about masculinity that is moving boys into these horrible, horrible situations? And it's not just mass shootings. I mean, it's every crime, uh, all violence is overwhelmingly yeah. committed by boys and, and men. So, the, my, so then, you know, my question is just why, why? And that's when I really started thinking about this topic in a more serious, deep way. And, and it became a letter to my son. It feels like like a book that no one else would write and when i say that i mean it's it feels risky like when i what do you mean when, when i say that i mean i feel like there is there's there's sort of the i feel like the in general there's there's a right wing of the country that is sort of like you know you know, uh, has, has a certain understanding of gender. We'll wait for Mike to reconnect. I think what he's saying is, and I could be wrong, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but there's a certain part of the, of the country that has very fixed ideas about gender. And then there's another part of the country and populace that has sort of more fluid ideas about gender and he might be asking how do you kind of thread that um and 
I think that's what he means by risky because he thinks you're going to piss off somebody or everybody. And my take on it was I, I was probably, I mean, I know I was much more inclined to side if there, if there is such a thing with the, you know, the left part of the country, the part that views gender more fluidly. I'm, I think I'm answering your question. Uh, can, you, can you hear me? No, no, can't can't hear you. But you look great. You look you look great. But we can't hear you, and you can't hear us. So just, you know, restart, start again, whatever it is. And I'll keep I'll keep answering the question. Um, wait, did you just say no, no, no? Um, and the and so I had to think about like what is my approach to this. And where I ended up is different than when I started, where I started when I started writing it. Where I started was the idea that okay. masculinity kind of needs to be reinvented. Where I ended was, can you hear me, Mike? Can you hear me? <laughs> this is going great. This is really going great. Can't hear you. And where I ended was, um, not that we need to reinvent, but that we need to expand. And so what that meant was embracing a lot of what I think the right likes about masculinity, um, embracing really traditional masculine ideas like strength, independence, endurance. These are like classically masculine ideals that we celebrate with girls. Like we say right now, like, we love strong girls and independent girls and girls who are brave and have endurance and all these things. And of course, like I celebrate that too, but that doesn't negate for girls, like their nurturing side, their caring side, their empathetic side, their team working side, their negotiating side. Um, so what we've done is we've kind of expanded femininity in the last 50 or 60 years because of the success of feminism, but we haven't expanded masculinity. If anything, in some ways we've shrunk it for a certain part of the population because when women start moving over into territory that men sort of thought of as their own, a certain part of the population ends up retreating into fixed ideas of masculinity and they become more rigid and more, and I'm gonna use a word that I've never said out loud, sclerotic sclerotic ideas of masculinity. And now I'm gonna look up the word sclerotic to make sure that I know what it means, sclerotic. I think it means overly rigid, um, becoming rigid and unresponsive, losing the ability to adjust. And I think there's a certain part of the population, the male population that has become sclerotic. And I worry that, the, and, and I think when that part of the population so often displays what we think of when we think of like toxic masculinity, but so does the rest of us. So do the rest of us. The rest of us who have grown up with these ideas, these traditional ideas of masculinity, we also can and do display toxic behaviors. I know I do. Now, that being said, I reject the notion of toxic masculinity uh, in general, if only because we don't have a kind of model of a healthy masculinity to contrast it with. So when we talk about masculinity, like we don't necessarily know what like healthy masculinity is. And so these sort of negative adjectives like toxic can affix themselves. Hey, are you there? Can you hear? Michael, great choice. I mean, great, great effort. They, they affix themselves to the word masculinity so easily that I, I, I think it, it, they, they almost become synonymous. So I worry about that. And it's why I try to avoid that label. Um, okay. Hey. Um, hear you. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. can't hear, I can't hear you, but you can hear me. I can hear you and you sound okay. great. You sound really good. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'll keep bloviating. I mean, that's what I do. 
I think I might, I might you can't hear me. I yep. think that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, Town Hall Seattle says, I might need to restart the computer again. That's what I'm going to do. And then I will join you in moments. I apologize. No problem. I'll read, I'll read like a little section of the book. And yeah, Michael. Hi, everyone. This is Josh from Town Hall. Sorry we're running into these issues. Um, yeah, if you're fine just doing your it's own thing, <laughs> we'll figure this out with Mike. That'd be great. Yeah, it's Mike's fault. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to read just a page and a half or so from Chapter 2. Chapter 2 is entitled Rosary. And then the and I'm Jewish, by the way, but I just like the image. And then the subtitle is Tell Your Kids You Love Them. One of my favorite photos of my dad, your grandpa, is also one of the last he ever took. He's 39. In the photo, dad wears a slight embarrassed smile below the goofy teddy bear baseball cap his wife Beth had given him to cover the new scar that stretches across his skull. He'd undergone emergency brain surgery a couple months before, after the police found him slumped over in his car, unconscious. An assault, they thought, maybe a mugging gone bad. They didn't know. My mom told us about it the following morning. He was gonna be okay, she said. And I remember thinking something like, of course he's gonna be okay. I'd never considered that my father could be hurt, let alone die. A few days later, your uncle Eric and I went to see him at the hospital. I remember him in bed, head shaved and bandaged, sleepy and frail, his body covered in a loose gown. I felt awkward and unsure and scared. His fragility frightened me more than anything else. He'd never been a big guy, but every father is a giant to his son, although less so when his son overtakes him in height as you, annoyingly, have done to me. We stayed with him for an hour or so that day, but he didn't talk much, and when we left him, I felt relieved. When Dad came home, he was weak and unsure on his feet. That Christmas, Beth gave him teddy bears, lots of teddy bears, big and small. One of the bears was sewn to the brim of a baseball cap, the dumb hat in the photo. A few months later, he would be back in the hospital where he died from a blood clot. I remember that tight smile of his. It was his all-purpose smile. It could mean joy, sorrow, frustration, bafflement, or some combination of those. It's a smile unwilling to commit to emotion. Every now and again, I catch myself making that same smile and I get a tingle of deja vu it's funny, I look more like my mom. I have her coloring and some of her facial features, but I have never felt possessed by her in the same way I do when I discover my dead father's expression on my face. Can you hear us, Mike? Yeah, that was so beautiful. Thanks. And look, I mean, the timing was perfect. Well, I right was basically appearing as your dad from the past. <laughs> The ghost of Schwartz's past. I changed my name. I was born oh, Michael I, Schwartz. Oh, I know. The, your, your, your fellow members of the state will never let you forget it. Well, how could I forget it? And, you know, and look, Michael Schwartz is a much funnier name than Michael Ian Black. There's no getting around it. <laughs> <laughs> had I um, known I was going to end in comedy, I probably would have just stuck with some version of Michael Schwartz because it's just funny. My contention about this book is, like I said, uh, it's very emotional, but it's it's risky. And you started to answer this, but then I got gob garbled into oblivion. Is um, it feels like you're not towing the line of the right wing about gender and the left wing about gender. You're literally inventing your own uh, version of it, which is to say, here's my experience of masculinity. Here's what yours could be. I don't know what it'll be. Yeah, and, and I, that's what I was bloviating about when you were off. I was, I was oh, sort okay. of guessing that was your question, something like that. Um, and I guess, I guess my follow-up question would be, were you afraid to do that? Because I have also been 
in the throngs of Twitter misinterpretations. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's call, let's just call friendly. Let's use a friendly term: miscommunications on Twitter and social media. And people just go at you. I mean, not yeah. you, but they go at one who is on Twitter saying something that is nuanced. And you, are, you know, you have two million Twitter followers. You're a very big personality. And so, did you fear that people would just come at you and have they? Um, yes, I was very afraid to write this book, not because of like Twitter reaction, although I guess that probably played into it to a certain extent, but just there were a lot of fears that I had. First of all, that I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I, you know, what am I? I'm some jerk off who shows up on TV once in a while. Um, I'm not an expert on this shit. I have a son, you know, and I have my own personal experiences to draw from. And so I didn't really feel qualified, but I felt like I had struggled with these questions a lot because of the nature of my childhood and the nature of my adulthood um, and, and just my nature. Um, and so I thought maybe I had something to offer, but yeah, I was very, I was very, afraid maybe isn't the right word. I was afraid not of offending. I wasn't afraid of um, whatever opinions I was going to end on. I was afraid which is so classic of men in general. I was afraid of looking foolish. Yeah. Not, not not necessarily of saying the wrong thing, but just of being an idiot. And to my surprise, I guess, um, the reaction has been really positive. Like there hasn't been the kind of blowback that I thought there might be. And I didn't really know who the blowback would come from. I just sort of saw, I just sort of thought I'm going to offend or hurt somebody here unintentionally. Um, but that hasn't happened. It might just be that the, the, the right or wrong people, depending on your point of view, haven't read the book yet. But so far, it's it's been pretty positive. I'm going to read uh, a short sentence from your from your book, page 245, where you say, Nothing is exceptional about me. And um, and then the question part is uh, is a very Bill O'Reilly-esque question. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> what is that? Come on. That's, that's not a bad question. Yeah, that's the question. That's the question. Come on. If you're not exceptional and you wrote this, this beautiful book, then who is exceptional? And I wonder, are you ordinary shaming me? Well, I'll take the second part of the question first. <laughs> Obviously. Oh, Dana, Sh Dana Schumann says, good job, Mike. <laughs> um, I just cornered you. I just cornered you. What I think I meant, what I know I meant, is that almost all of us, almost every single one of us on this planet falls within a very kind of neat bell curve of normalcy. Yeah. We're all You wrote you also wrote the bell curve, right? Am I correct? Yeah. Oh yeah. And I stand by every word of that. Every <laughs> racist word. Michael, um, no, don't even joke. Please. Oh, no. <laughs> Cut his mic. Cut his mic. <laughs> what I meant within a pretty small part of the bell curve, not all of us, but most of us. Sure. And when I say like, I'm not, I'm pretty ordinary. I am. I'm not extraordinary really in any way. I don't have extraordinary intelligence or extraordinary abilities. I'm not extraordinarily gifted in anything. And the point of saying it is to say like to my son and really to everybody, like you're enough, like whatever you have, whatever yeah. gifts you've yeah. given, they're enough. Like you don't need to be extraordinary. Yeah. Um, you can be normal, average, like all of us, and accomplish whatever it is you want to accomplish. I mean, Mike, look at you. Right. You you make great movies. And are you extraordinary? Oh, I mean, come on. I'll 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 do a, a reverse O'Reilly on you. Come on. Oh no. Cut this guy's bike. Cut this guy's bike. <laughs> Um, the, uh, 
What happened when you dropped acid? You only allude to it. Because uh, I've written about it before. Oh, okay, um, okay. Me and my friends from the state, not all of them, a few of them, dropped acid in the in the Badlands of South Dakota. It was the first time I'd ever done anything. I'd never even drank before. I was about 23 and uh, we were in this moonscape in South Dakota. And I was just like, fuck it, I'll, I'll try this. <laughs> and started hallucinating immediately. I mean, the first thing I remember is seeing John Ritter's enormous face carved into the rocks. And, you know, John Ritter's great. I was happy about that. And then as the sun started setting, I remember seeing the gates of hell opening up in front of me, but in a nice way, it wasn't scary. But then we were all so high, we didn't realize like when the sun was setting, eventually the sun would go down. And if you've ever been to the Badlands, it's cavernous and it's not lit. There's no <laughs> paths and we're high out of our minds in the Badlands and not knowing how to get back to the car and I really remember having no depth perception. Like I couldn't tell if something was six inches below me or six feet below me. Yeah. So there was like a really terrifying few moments where I was like, well, I'm just gonna have to sit here on the bathroom until dawn because <laughs> if I move, I'm gonna fall into a chasm. Uh. <laughs> but we did eventually make our way to the car uh, and it was like, it was such a great first drug experience because it had everything. It had high highs and low lows. I saw a UFO. I saw the gates of hell. <laughs> it was perfect. Um, despite the stereotype of actors being airheads, they actually tend to be smart, inquisitive and empathetic. And despite the stereotypes of comedians being depressive misanthropes, they're actually de depressive misanthropes. That's right. <laughs> Tell me more about this. Did I write that? Uh, uh, I thought that was an audience. I thought that was an audience question. I was like, yeah, that sounds right. And then I realized, oh, no, I wrote that. <laughs> I see, I wrote, Talk about this. <laughs> Your questions are so good. Come on. And Come talk on. about this. Talk about this. Don't you find... I mean, first of all, actors generally do tend to be quite intelligent. Like, successful actors tend to be some of the most, um, they're like just naturally curious people. They have, a, a, and, it, and it really informs their work. It's why they're successful. There are dummies, of course, but there are in every profession. But most actors that I know who, are, who, are, who work a lot tend to be really smart, informed, curious people. Comedians yeah. also tend to be in, smart, curious, informed, depressive misanthropes. Um, there's something about, whatever pain that they have undergone, most of them, some sort of trauma, something that leads them into comedy. Not everybody. I don't know what your childhood was like, Mike, but you seem pretty well adjusted. Well, that's a whole other book. That's that's this book. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, uh, that's another book and also Sleepwalk With Me has some of that. Yeah. And then you're also buddies with like Mulaney, who also seems like the best adjusted person in the world. I'm not gonna speak on his behalf. Please do. Uh, but uh, I'd say that's a complex answer as well. Yeah, I mean, we all have complex pasts, but com sure. comedians tend to be, you know, m on average, a little more depressive and misanthropic than the general population. I think that's my. I think one of the things I'm sort of blown away by in the book is that, and this is what I was getting at when I was saying that there's the polarized arguments about gender. You have one side that says gender is a construct, sex and gender are completely different from each other. There's another side that basically says gender is the defining characteristic of existence, basically, <laughs> right? Right. I mean, that's how I would describe the two sides. This book is not that. This book is... Uh, it's somewhere in between uh, those two things. And I'd be curious to say like, like how much of a part of, of de defining your childhood was it? Was gender? Yeah. Uh, even though I wasn't aware of it at the time, it's a huge amount. And I wasn't really conscious of it, but my mom and my dad split up when I was young. 
my mom uh, and because of the breakup, although they would have broken up anyway. Um, and the kind of feminism that my mom and her partner were exhibiting, which was very prevalent in our household, was also really strident and almost um, anti-male. It was almost the caricature of like 70s, 80s feminism, yeah. which, which guys so often, I think, misunderstand and think, oh, you know, women all hate men. In my household, oddly, they kind of hated men for a wow. while. Um, and there's good reasons for it, I think, that I won't go into now. But it had a lot to do with both of their upbringings, both of their um, frustrations with the, with their opportunities that were given to them or not given to them in the world, the circumstances that they found themselves in. And so when they found each other, they just sort of like exploded outwards. It, it, yeah. it, was, it was an unhealthy relationship between the two of them. And also their relationship to men, I think, was also unhealthy. And as a result, I felt as a boy growing up in that household, like I was just felt defensive of my own gender. And that defensiveness informed, I think, a lot of my upbringing and my future consideration of it as an adult. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> yeah, I totally get that. I mean, one of the things I, I heard in an interview the other day, you mentioned that your son had not read the book yet. Has he mm -hmm. still not? Has he still not read the book? I don't. I, what's the update on that? No. <laughs> he started did, it. Did you give he, it to him? Did you give? Did you ago, hand him the book? Months, months ago. Months ago. It's been sitting on his nightstand table for probably five months. Um, I think he started reading it when it came out, and he's like, yeah, "I don't like this." And I was like, "All right, why don't you like?" He's like, because it doesn't sound like you. It's not the way you talk to me. And I'm like, yeah, I get that. Because he's like, it's your writer voice. I'm like, yeah, because it's a fucking book, you wow. dick. <laughs> you know, <laughs> fucking dick. Wow. Um, but Shots really, fired. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, we haven't spoken since. Um, what I think it is, ultimately, is I think it's hard. I think it's hard to read a book by your dad where he's just super open and honest and vulnerable. It's all the stuff that like I'm preaching to myself yeah. um, and, and, and trying to get other guys to do. And yet when I try to do it with my son, he's like, yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> so, you know, we all well, fall into these traps. Well, it's almost like the book that you wanted your dad to write for you or just some of the stuff you wanted him to say to you that he never did. And I say that in the book, I say, you know, I wish I wish I'd been able to have this conversation with my dad. Um, my dad was incapable of having this kind of conversation. And so writing this letter to my son, to me, also feels like I'm writing this letter to my dad. Yeah. Um, it really, to me, feels like a, a conversation I wish I could have had with him. And in a, in a way, it's made me feel closer to him. Yeah, I can relate to the other part of the book that you say where where you think about how your dad died young and that you're not, you don't feel distant from that in a certain way. No, it, it's weird. Like you would think, I would have thought, 30 years plus 30 yeah geez 30 plus years from his death mike there would be distance and there is chronologically but it's almost like the older i get the more tied i feel to it yeah. and when I became older than he ever was, when I be when I turned 40, a weird thing started happening for me psychologically, which is I started feeling kind of like I was taking him with me in a way that I hadn't before. Like I was almost walking for him and with him 
into this uncharted time. And it, and it's, it made me feel a weird kind of responsibility to him to like sort of show him like, oh yeah, this is what your forties would have looked like, you know? Um, By the way, just to, just to be clear, this isn't how you talk. <laughs> is this my writer voice? Boom, boom. <laughs> this whole thing, this whole event was building up to that moment. <laughs> this isn't how you talk. This is Shit. your writerly voice. Shit. I've been I, called out. I've been in a text chain with your children. <laughs> yeah. It's weird to have my kids' numbers. It's we I mean, I don't mind, but it's weird. It's, it's funny weird. Be, it's funny because my daughter's five, and that's what my my book is about. Sort of my my wife and I deciding to have a child and having a child and sort of not wanting it and then and then being sort of in, finding myself in, yeah, in a very big way by the end. Um, did you want to have kids? Theoretically, I did. Yeah. Theoretically, I was like, yeah, we should have kids. But like, you don't know what that means till you do it, you know? Yeah. And I wasn't like, I wasn't like jonesing to be a dad. I wasn't like every fiber of my being like really needs to be a dad, not at all. Yeah. Um, but it was, it just felt like theoretically, do I want to have kids? Yeah. All right. Well, we should have a kid or two. And then we did the it. Same, and, the same way that you were like, should I be on I Love the 80s? Sure. I'll do that. A little bit. But that was more like, well, they pay me. And I knew they weren't going to pay me to have kids. <laughs> <laughs> if they were like, yeah, we'll pay you to have some kids, I'd be like, fuck yeah. I'll have as many as you want. Like, whatever. Um, but this I knew was going to actually end up costing me money, and it has. And you know, you talk about this in, in the new one in your show about just the the unpreparedness. You know, nobody can be prepared for it. There's no way to prepare for it, and especially as a guy, when you feel so useless when the baby is new or babies are new, and you know, there's this new dude living in your house in my case, a dude. And like, you don't know this guy, you know what I mean? There's just some guy living there and you have to like come to some accommodations because your wife and this dude like really love each other. And yeah. you're sort of left on the side like, Hey, I'm here too. It's hard. It's almost like, I, I think that the, I real what I really admire about the book is that like in this moment in time, in, in this moment in history, it's like, who wants to hold a candle for, the struggle of of the white boy in America who's been privileged and you talk extensively about white privilege and white male privilege. And the answer is you. I do. <laughs> Who I'm wants to do that? that? You're in. You did it. <laughs> I'm like, I cheered for white guys. Well, what I'm saying to my son is like, look, this is who you are. Understand yeah. who you are. Understand what you be what you've been given, and understand your responsibilities that go along with that. And I'm pointing my finger angrily at him as I'm doing it. And you're the you're the problem. It's so funny because the a, a bunch of the people who might be really drawn to this, who are very into like, how come you know like women's studies how come there's no men's studies and like mm -hmm. you hear that a lot you know because mm -hmm. i took women's studies classes in college and you a lot of times you hear that argument of like Af you know african-american studies what about white studies whatever the thing is i don't know what the counter that's reverse racism that whole thing right and uh but your i think your point is really interesting which is you can't just ignore an entire group of people and go, you figure that you figure it out. Right. Be because there's a lot of danger in that. Yeah. And when we correctly assign, let's call it responsibility for a lot of society's ills. And when we say, this is kind of where the power structure is, and you need to understand that power structure and understand everything that flows from that power structure, like there's nothing wrong in pointing that out. In fact, I would say it's obligatory. So I'm coming at it, you know, so if you're a African-American 
um, you can look at that power structure and want to dismantle it necessarily. I mean, you would you would want that. And I can say as a white dude, I understand this power structure. I also want to dismantle it because it's better for everybody if we mm -hmm. dismantle it. It's better for all of us. And you don't have to apologize Great. for being born into a certain part of this power structure, but you should yeah. understand where you are and you should understand your responsibilities to help make it more equitable for everybody. I think that's really smart. So, yeah, I'm, holding, I'm holding a tiki torch for the white man. Absolutely. Oh my God, please strike that from the record. Um, but it's a tiki it's a tiki torch saying, yeah, we got to snuff out this tiki torch, you know? It's like, here we are. <laughs> and and um, yeah, exactly. Well done. Well done. Um, so if you guys want to, or if you folks, I've gotten out of the habit of saying you guys, because in Massachusetts, we always, it was a colloquialism. We go, hey, you guys, you guys, mm -hmm. we're going over to the pool. Uh, and uh, and then in my newsletter, my email newsletter, I say, hey, guys, blah, blah, blah. And people have have pointed out to me that they are not guys. Right. And so I now I say, hey, friends. Hey, folks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've been I've been I've been retraining my brain on that one. I am still That's willing good. to I'm still willing to learn at 42, Michael. It's admirable. And I'm going to give you whatever pat on the back you need. That's me blowing out the tiki torch. <laughs> okay, so questions um, in the questions and answers section. So if you go down to ask a question, just pop a question in there. And we're going to start with Monica Newman. And Deb, Deb is pointing out, as a woman who says you guys to groups of all genders, I think about this regularly. I know, I do too. Deb. I have spent some time thinking about the phrase you guys and wondering whether it has crossed over the lexicon into a gender neutral phrase. Yes. I think it has, although I can certainly understand why somebody would be like, can you please not call me a guy? I'm not same a with, guy. Same even with like, dude, dude. Yeah, almost. Sort of, dude, dude. Like I know a lot of women who call other women dude, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I don't know what any of that stuff is at a certain point, but I'm also sort of I'm I'm game to to try other stuff yeah. if people if yeah. people are, are concerned. I regularly say you guys and have thought about it. I've never had pushback on it, and if I did, I guess I would probably change it. I just sort of I just I think of it as a kind of gender neutral. My problem with the word folks is that it always feels a little bit patronizing. Uh, it always feels, it, to me, it's the word that politicians use when they want to relate to the common man. They say, you know, folks, and I always just like recoil because I'm not yeah. folksy. I get, I get that. And also it's so old fashioned. The hey folks, mm -hmm. like it feels so stand up comedy from the 1960s or something. Oh, um, this uh, Erica, uh, Erica in the chat just posted an article about this. The problem with hey guys, hey guys. a broad coalition English speakers, teachers, retail workers, ice cream scoopers, and plenty of others is grasping for a more inclusive greeting. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah, I'm down for that. Mm -hmm. I say, hey, friends, because it's like, well, what, what, what do you have to lose there? Well, I don't believe you necessarily. I don't, you know. <laughs> hey, how about, about co co-worker? Hey, co-worker. <laughs> Hey, people. Hey, people's all right. Hey, what's, going on, so, what's up, associates? Hey, cohorts. How you doing? Um, all, so, all you know, work. Deb is pointing out y'all is pretty good. Y'all is solid. Is hey, y'all. It is good. Um, unfortunately, it's so geographic that if I say it, I know. Uh, people will be making fun of. Beth, Beth is suggesting landlubbers and swashbucklers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're contradictory terms, but yeah. <laughs> I guess if you use them both simultaneously, then it is more inclusive. Hey, landlubbers and swashbucklers. <laughs> <laughs> um, Patty says, hey, friend, sounds like elementary school. And Dana says, yes, oh. y'all, is the solution. Be careful yeah, with that word solution. That was a dangerous term. <laughs> uh, um, that was pretty good. Top uh, top tip, better man. Top tip, please. Huh. Uh, 
Top tip, meaning top what? Tip. I think like book? a like a piece of advice, piece of advice maybe. Is that what you what you're getting at? Top tip, Christine? That's what she's asking. And I will give one that I think is going to sound really generic, but I believe it. And my top tip for men and guys and boys is to practice the art of listening, not hearing necessarily, although that is certainly an ingredient, but listening to what other people are saying. What's that, Michael? Um, say, what's that, Michael? Say it again. Oh, come on. I didn't catch it the first time. I'm sorry. Listen is the um, is the is the advice um that listening hearing somebody else's story and perspective is the gateway i think to empathy if we can hear what other people are saying without being defensive um yeah listening is then i think, then we you know, take a step forward listening of course is the key to uh, the only thing I've ever studied very seriously, which is improv and stand-up comedy, the the mm -hmm. listen listening is everything. It's mm -hmm. all you have in improv, literally. Well, the you best, have funny faces. Well, I have wacky faces. I've got silly voices, and I've got listening. Um, mm -hmm. Monica Newman asks a very good question. What value do you feel this book would have for your daughter or daughters in general? Um, so although it's written to my son, there's a lot about my daughter in it. Um, and I think it is valuable for girls and women in general. Um, and oddly and disappointingly, maybe, although in a way, is that I think women are probably going to be more inclined to read this than men. You know, it's it's a weird thing that when you talk about masculinity and you want to talk about exploring masculinity, the guys who are probably should hear this the most are the guys who are least willing to listen to it. They're the guys who are going to be like, fuck you, like I'm fine. And that's a kind of paradox around masculinity. Women have a lot of space in their lives to talk about being women. Men don't have a lot of space in their lives to talk about being men. And the people who spend more time talking about men is women because for a variety of reasons. One, because they have the space to talk about this stuff just because of how they're raised and, and, and who they are. And also because uh, men are still the dominant power structure in this country. It's there's still a patriarchy. So despite the fact that women are making like amazing gains, um, that patriarchy is still kind of it's still right there. It might be crumbling a little bit, but it's still right there. So the analogy that I use in the book is men often talk about how mysterious women are, how enigmatic women are, and. <clears throat> women talk about how they understand men better than men understand women. And it's, it's, it's a sense of like speaking two different languages and women are forced to speak the language of men the same way that Latvians are forced to learn Russian because in that part of the world, Russia is the dominant power, but Russia's Russians don't speak Latvian at nearly the same rate. And so women are like the Latvians there where they're like, we they have to learn the language of masculinity. And men, up until very recently and to this day to a lot, to a certain degree, don't have to learn the language of women. But what I guess what I'm saying is, but we do. Can you speak a little bit more about Latvia? It's one of the better vias <laughs> in Eastern Europe. Nathaniel's asking a writing question. Can you speak about the challenges of transitioning from two different genres, humor and jokes versus long form and prose? Um, well, I'm not a good joke writer. Um, That's not so true. I get, okay, I'm a Come good on. joke writer. Come on! Come um, on! In a lot of ways, they're similar. So 
one of the things that I've learned about prose writing and that I keep relearning and teaching myself is that the same economy of language that makes a good sentence, prose sentence, is the same economy of language that you want to have in joke writing. Like you're always looking to trim fat. You're always looking for kind of the way to get to the point as neatly as you can. It's super hard. Like writing does not come easily to me. Joke writing, joke telling does not come easily to me. When I say like I'm not extraordinary, um, like I really mean it. Everything I do is, you know, I, I don't feel like I have any great natural gifts. There's things I kind of gravitate towards the way we all do, but I have to work at them. I mean, it's, it's hard work. Writing a book is torturously hard. Yeah. Uh, and there's just no getting around it. It, it, it. Every writer I talk to says the same thing. It's just really hard work. And like with anything else, the only way to overcome the difficulty of it is to just show up and keep going. Yeah, I think that's right. Did you, was that, was your system to sort of get up at a certain time every day and write a certain number of pages or for a certain amount of time? Yeah, I mean, my system probably should and could be refined. I tend to get up early. When I'm writing, I tend to like sit down and basically write until I can't anymore. But that can't might just be an hour. It might be two hours. It might be till lunch. Um, and when I say write, what I really mean is like stare at the screen and check Twitter and come back to it and write a sentence and erase that sentence and try again and sometimes tap out 300, 400 words and think, oh yeah, you're really onto something until the next day when you look at it and you're like, oh, that's just shit. Um, my writing is not, it's not a smooth process. It's not an easy process. And it, and it's, yeah, I don't, I, I, I've tried to be like, I'm going to be, I'm going to be the guy that writes a thousand words a day. I can't, I just can't. You, in the East Village in the late 90s, I, w I went to New York and my friend Ptolemy and Chris and I ran into you in the street and you were walking your dog. And and we were super, we were huge fans from the state. And we said, we're big fans. And we go, and then we tried to come up with uh, something to say. And we go, nice dog. Mm -hmm. And you said, he's my writing partner. <laughs> That's a good joke. It's true. <laughs> true story. I never told you that story. I've never I just, heard that before. I and I'm just going to it, it, it. It, it's that I I wrote it down when I was reading because I was because I actually do think it's your authentic voice on the page, and it reminded me of spending time with you. And a lot of times I'll write in the margins as I'm reading things, just things that occur to me, and I had that memory flash. That's so funny. I don't remember that. Um, but it, I, I, I'm, I'm impressed with the joke. I think it's you a had, good joke. You had sort of a little dog in the East Village, right? It wasn't a little dog. It was a lab. It was oh, okay. Uh, it was a white lab. She died shortly after. Oh, well. Da Dana Schumann says you just perfectly described writing, which I think is a great is true. Um, yeah. it's, it's hard. Let's it's hard. let's do uh, just one more question. Um, there's two that were answered uh, on, from the, the thing. I mean, what's the hardest thing about being male? I feel like that's sort of a whole book. Like, I don't even know how you'd, you'd, you'd uh, break that down. Or if you well, want to take a crack at it, by all means. I think I'm assuming that question is coming from a woman. Um, it's from Katie. It's from Katie, who I'm assuming is a woman. Yeah, I, I would answer it with the old joke about the two fish who are swimming and they pass another and the fish says, uh, the water's great today. And they're like, yeah. And then the fish passes and the, and the, and the one fish turns to the other and goes, what's water? I mean, like if it's your <laughs> experience, you don't know like how to compare it to anything else. If I had, I will say, I think I can answer this question actually because I feel like I, I've thought about it enough. The hardest part about being a guy is the idea of invulnerability that we inevitably are meant to um, inhabit 
and create. We are, we are routinely asked to create an invulnerable facade that doesn't feel true for anybody. Mm. Um, and then at some point in your life, I think if you're being a conscious human as a guy, you understand that it's not serving you and you have to figure out ways to lower your guard. Building the wall is easy. We, we end up doing it for the first however many years of our life. Dismantling that wall is incredibly difficult. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I had the same experience. Like I, I feel like the first 18 or 19 years of my life, I spent thinking, uh, I am not connecting with other people very well. <laughs> like this is not, I'm, there, there's something either I'm missing or there's something <laughs> they're missing. And I, and I don't know what's going on. And then when I got to college and I was surrounded by some people who were sort of more like-minded and maybe a, a little bit more sort of emotionally in touch with their feelings and, and uh, self-aware, I started to feel uh, somewhat more assured that I could find a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took me longer. I wish I'd only been 19, 20 before I recognized, even though I had found people that I loved and that I felt connected to, um, I wish I had trusted myself enough to be myself. And it took me many years after that to start that process. Yeah. Well, this is awesome. Um, thanks, everybody, uh, for tuning in. Uh, Michael, uh, I just want to plug the book again. It's called The Better Man. You can purchase it at the bottom of the screen, which is buy the book. And you'd be purchasing it from Elliott Bay Books in Seattle. And one thing about the pandemic is that we should all be supporting local everything as much as possible. Local books, local pizza, local, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of what, whatever, what, local coffee. That's a good one. Well, what does it mean to support, to not support local pizza? What does that mean? Domino's. I see. Okay. Fair. Uh, Papa John's. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, that's also kind of not good too, you know? Lo local usually is better, especially if you're a discerning customer. And we know and, you are. That is, and yeah, that and, is your and, and bookstores, local bookstores tend to be very discerning uh, customers and friends to authors like Michael and myself and others. And they support us and we're trying to support them as, as much as we can as well. So buy the book in the chat. I highly recommend it. It made me cry. It made me laugh. It, it has a lot of wisdom in it. I think it's good for, in the audiobook as well, Catherine, asking in the chat. The audiobook is wonderful. Um, I'd recommend it for anyone age 13 and up, maybe. Sure. Like, I'm trying to think of what the age group would be. Like, I think it is good for teenagers and up. Um, it's but it's good for me. I'm 42 and it was great for me. So, I mean, maybe like if you're just about to die, maybe don't read it because like you got to I mean, like you got other things to think about. You know, you're getting your affairs in order at that point. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. I appreciate Michael, you having me. For Biglia, thank you so much for preparing, for reading the book, for being my friend and for all of your humor and jokes over the years. I remain a fan. And I love you. And I love you too. I hope we I hope we I hope we move the needle on some of those C's into A's. Yeah. Hope C's. Do we have do we have some A's now? Do we have some A's? <laughs> I guess it's A's. Right? A's read the book. B's are buying the book or will buy. Oh right. B's. Do we have some B's? <laughs> <laughs> says, all right. Thank you all. And I agree. Thanks, y'all. All right. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, friends. Thanks, associates. Or D, buying for sure, says Bradford. I got some awesome. A's. Good, great. I love books, it. books, everybody. Books are the answer. And this book, especially. But don't and buy this, don't buy this hat. <laughs>
I kind of want one of those hats. And also, if you haven't read it, read the new one, which is really great and warm and funny and wonderful and uh, was a Broadway show and probably he'll tour with it. I mean, you probably, you have toured with it for a long time. Um, but yeah, read the new one. It's, it's, it's Mike Brubigley at his finest. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Love you, Seattle. Stay, stay healthy. Stay well. I love you guys, and I'll visit real soon. Bye, proud boys and girls. Oh, no. No, no, no. no, no, no. no, no. Cut the mic. Cut the mic.